Uh, thank you very much for those uh, introductory remarks. Uh, uh, David Welch, who I've known for 20 years, uh, has been teasing me since yesterday because he's never heard me referred to as a helmsman before. It's a great honor. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to live up to that description. I'm really pleased to be here. I arrived uh, at Ohio State just about a year ago, and I had a chance to make some very brief comments uh, last year about this time. Uh, and we had a distinguished speaker from, I think, Columbia uh, University. And uh, I had no idea that I would be following in, uh, in the footsteps of the illustrious speakers who come before you. And I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, the title of my presentation uh, is up there on the screen. And I've got a few informal comments uh, to make as I move into my formal presentation. So let me, let me get started. First of all, uh, whenever I'm with Professor Miyazaki, he very proudly uh, speaks to uh, his interests in economics. And you just heard him refer to uh, a similarity between his work and my interest in resource management. Uh, and, and so I've tried to organize my presentation today to be a bit more oriented towards some economic questions than might otherwise be the case. I'm, I'm more of a, a political geographer than an economic geographer. I'm, I'm very interested in policy. Uh, and uh, this presentation is not so much about that. It's about work I've been doing for the last 20 years, as you just heard, as an advisor to the Shigasawa Age Memorial Foundation. Uh, a, uh, an opportunity that came my way because of uh, the fact that I, I went to college with the daughter of the great-grandson of, of Shigusawa Eiji, and through her met uh, her father. Uh, and uh, when my research interests at the graduate level turned to Japan, that led to a long relationship, uh, 20 years of which I've been uh, in this advisory role. And the advisory role is uh, where I met David Welch, uh, who's at the University of Waterloo, and David very graciously not only agreed to come and present on uh, some maritime questions related to China and Japan yesterday, but he agreed today to be the discussant. Uh, like me, he's been associated with the foundation for the last 20 years, uh, and in his own right, uh, is very knowledgeable uh, about the topic uh, that's under discussion today. I'm looking forward to having the privilege of his comments at the end. And then, last but certainly not least, uh, he and I both look forward to any questions that you might have at the end of the program. I thought I'd, I'd begin uh, with a presentation overview. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm very interested in uh, questions of uh, international education and global engagement as part of my current appointment here at Ohio State University. And, uh, and uh, that this relates to the comment I just made about um, how I want to pivot to a certain extent toward uh, some economic questions. Um, you'll see where I'm headed in just a moment with a chart that I'm going to put up. But in terms of the opening uh, segment of my presentation, uh, there's, there's a great deal of interest in the United States right now about the importance of our student graduates needing to have expanded intercultural skills and understanding of societies and cultures outside the United States. Uh, and the thought occurred to me that uh, my work with the foundation, my own journey to uh, study Japan and arrive here at Ohio State is an illustration of I think some insights into how do we develop an expanded intercultural skill base and understanding of societies and cultures outside the United States. And then the case study itself will be looking at uh, Shigasawa Eiji as an entrepreneur and a philanthropist. Um, I see some relevance, of course, to his uh, legacy for the East Asia Studies Center in his 50th uh, anniversary year and the Institute for Japanese Studies. I'll be making some comments about that. And then uh, finally, and uh, perhaps most importantly, there's, there's discussion uh, among Japanologists, uh, both here 
the West and also uh, uh, students of Japan, of course, in Japan itself, about whether the, the country is poised for a new Meiji era. Uh, and it's, it's uh, important to recognize that Shigesawaichi was one of the great architects of Japan's modernization over the course of uh, the Meiji period. Uh, and there's some insight, I think, that can be lent to this discussion about whether Japan might, in the 21st century, be in a position to replicate some of the great achievements that it uh, achieved uh, in the 20th, late 19th, and early 20th century, in part due to his leadership. So I'll, I'll be focusing on that toward the end of my presentation today. Now, this question of um, how do we prepare students to work and, and uh, be citizens uh, and live uh, satisfying lives in, a, in an increasingly globally interconnected world is captured well by uh, some statements by the American Council on Education. Uh, and I wanted to share this particular one with you. We, we do need here at our university and at universities across the United States and Canada uh, to uh, aim to create a truly world-class higher education system. And to do that, we have to be globally engaged and prepare our students to be citizens of a multicultural community, both at home and in a globalized world. And we accomplish this through multidimensional, comprehensive strategies that include internationalization at home and engagement with global issues and partners, as represented by uh, today's uh, events and, and work that is pursued by not only the East Asian Studies Center, but the Institute for Japanese Studies, the Institute for Korean Studies, the Institute for Chinese Studies, just to mention a few um, primary activities here at the university. I want to make sure that everyone is aware of the fact that uh, the Office of International Affairs that uh, I represent today uh, has a long-standing feature of Ohio State University. Uh, it's the part of the university that recruits and advises international students. We're a very large university, 68,000 students, uh, and we have uh, uh, in, uh, uh, ranked in the top 20 for international students with a little over 8,000, hailing from 117 countries. This is uh, data from the most recent survey from 2018. The office also develops education abroad opportunities pursue strategic planning and strategic partnerships, uh, not only with other universities around the world, but also uh, uh, locally with, with our non-governmental organizations and our corporate organizations, uh, including the sponsors uh, of the Brad Richardson Memorial Fund, as we just heard reference to. We're very interested uh, in helping the university think about how do we embed global themes into the curriculum, otherwise referred to as curriculum internationalization. And of course, last but certainly not least, we are uh, committed to supporting faculty research on international topics, uh, and we do this in a variety of ways. I'll be talking about this a little bit more in my remarks. But I want to highlight that there are really three innovative features of the Office of International Affairs at the university. One, as you've heard from Professor Miyazaki, is that we have area study centers not only uh, for East Asia, but also Latin America and Eastern Europe. These are federally funded uh, area study centers. We have global gateway offices, three of them, in, in uh, respectively Shanghai, Mumbai, and Sao Paulo. Um, these are uh, very small operations with local employees who represent the university, conduct outreach to our alumni, help identify the next generation of students who want to come study at Ohio State. Uh, and they also uh, are a destination for our study abroad programs, for faculty research, for convening conferences, uh, and, and representing innovation and the work of our global engagement in those ways. And then lastly, we have something called the Global One Health Program, which has a field station in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And this is the the largest interdisciplinary, uh, internationally oriented program uh, on the campus, which looks at the transmission of infectious disease primarily between animals and humans, and very much at the center of the current uh, coronavirus uh, issues that we're talking about. Uh, 
on a daily basis for the rest of the time. So I've used some terms. I want to make sure that uh, uh, I clarify for you, and then I'll move into my presentation. This, this term internationalization is one that I typically don't use outside of the campus. Um, it, it can be very confusing. Uh, one example of the confusion surrounding it as an initiative of higher education in the United States is uh, the tendency to use it interchangeably with globalization. Uh, I take the position, and many of my peers take the position, that the two are not interchangeable. I'd like to suggest to you that globalization is the movement of people, ideas, goods, capital, services, pollution, diseases, for example, across borders. And internationalization is higher education's engagement with that reality. And we do this, uh, I have a, a formal definition up here that I won't read, but if you think of the basic definition of the university as teaching research and service or engagement, service and engagement being interchangeable, then what internationalization aims to do is, is bring a global dimension into those activities of a comprehensive university through teaching, research, and engagement. And I want to tip my hat to Professor Miyazaki with this, uh, this particular chart. I've, I've been fascinated with the way in which employer interviews have established uh, the need for expanded knowledge and skills to succeed in the global economy. And I'm summarizing here uh, some statistics, interviews uh, from stati uh, statistics from interviews in 2007, 2015, uh, where there's a remarkably high affirmative response from the business community about the importance of intercultural knowledge and global issues or intercultural skills and understanding of societies and cultures outside the United States. Just want to highlight uh, the 78 percent figure here at the top of this chart. Uh, if that's not an argument for uh, the work of the East Asia Study Center or the Institute for Japanese Studies or um, our Department of East Asian Languages and Literature, uh, I don't know what it is. Uh, and uh, of course, this is a question that gets directly at what the College of Business might do, the Fisher College. Uh, but it's a much bigger question than simply asking how does a market operate uh, across the world? It's the question of how do we interact constructively with people from different cultures? How do we look at questions from different cultural points of view? How do we develop critical thinking skills? How do we work on teams uh, comprised of people from different uh, countries uh, and of different age groups? And I'm sure that uh, the, the Honorary Council General and uh, the companies supporting us today uh, could tell many, many stories about the significance of these skills for uh, the success of their operations. So we, we, I put this as a backdrop to the case study that I'll now turn to, uh, where I want to argue that uh, the importance of uh, looking at other cultures, in this case Japan, from a historical point of view, can help answer the question of how do we develop these intercultural uh, competencies uh, that are at the heart of some of our efforts to uh, pursue the question of internationalization uh, in the academy today. Okay, so let me move into uh, my remarks on uh, the foundation and on Ashima uh, This 20-year period that I referred to uh, has launched uh, a variety of projects focused on the rediscovery of Shibasawa Eiji. 20 years ago, uh, one could argue that he was uh, not just simply a big man, but a big man in Japanese history, revered for his extraordinary accomplishments, which I'll talk about more in detail and which are summarized on the handout that we've distributed, uh, but one whose achievements were receding uh, in the, to the past, like other great figures before him. Thanks in part to the Foundation's efforts, uh, he and his life seem to have revived and captured the interest of the times, being introduced frequently in the media in the context of issues facing Japan today, uh, not the least of which is that, uh, as uh, Professor Miyazaki noted on his opening slide, uh, Shibasawa Eiji has been designated as the visage uh, on the 10,000 yen note 
uh, that would be reissued in the next five years. And so I want to argue and, and present information on the historical significance of this person, um, how the work of the foundation seeks to identify the contemporary meaning of his life and work. A couple of pictures. Uh, this is a, a picture uh, that is commonly associated with uh, Aichi. Um, he lived to be 91 years old, uh, born in 1840, uh, died in 1931. Uh, this is his great grandson, uh, Masahide Shigasawa, uh, born in 1925. And if you could do the math very quickly in your head, he just turned 95 this month. Uh, so uh, there's some special celebrations that are in store because of the significance of that achievement and the fact that he has outlived his great grandfather by five years now. He's the current president and chief executive author, officer of the Shigasawa Aichi Memorial Foundation. And as I mentioned, the father of my classmate when I was in college many years ago. So, one way to think about uh, AG uh, is as a force of history uh, in terms of his leadership and civic values. Uh, descriptive terms like extraordinary leader, nation builder, entrepreneur, social reformer are rarely used to describe Japan's intelligentsia at the turn of the 21st century much less one individual man or woman. Yet many accord such accolades to age. He is a descriptor of how his leadership responded to the challenges faced by modern Japan, and his achievements continue to set the standard by which many great accomplishments of the country can be measured. In reviewing his legacy, it becomes clear that he was a bold, decisive, and visionary national and international leader. Uh, whose life was characterized as it stretched across the late 19th and early 20th centuries by such capacities. Uh, his prowess in the business world is illustrated by the role he played in the creation of the Ministry of Finance in Japan's first Western-style bank, Daiichi Kokuritsu Ginko, and the astonishing fact that he was involved in the creation of hundreds of companies and business associations which covered the entire spectrum of Japan's newly emerging modern economy. And one of the statistics that goes along with this is that uh, he was he involved in the establishment and operation of roughly 500 copy companies during his lifetime uh, and an estimated nine, 600 nonprofit uh, organizations. He struggled intellectually with questions of moral leadership as Japan sought uh, to transform its feudal society, and for guidance on such matters, he became a widely acknowledged Confucian scholar. Uh, his sense of social convictions were manifested in terms of philanthropy, and they were equally strong. Uh, early on, for example, in his career as a banker, uh, he volunteered to reactivate the poverty relief system of uh, the Tokugawa government, which was subsequently re reorganized into the Tokyo Yoiku, the forerunner of Japan's social welfare system. And interestingly, he served as the head of this organization for more than five decades until his death in 1931. Early in the Meiji era, that is the period between 1868 and 1912, Aichi articulated the view that national reform was needed in order to respond to Western imperial activity in East Asia. He was quite strategic in the way he introduced the key concept around which Western civilization was organized, abandoning uh, the doctrine of Sol no Joi, or revere the emperor and expel the barbarians. He introduced and transplanted into Japanese business and society various aspects of Western thought, technology, and most importantly, the notion of capital in order to encourage Japan's modernization. To do this, he initiated reforms that revolutionized the modes of thought characteristic of the secluded Tokugawa era, 1603 to 1867, establishing in the process new forms of social and economic organization. To realize uh, a new and more appropriate social system for the country, Aichi addressed the need for a national consciousness regarding the concept of public and the nature of Japan's economy. This is a very interesting feature, a very distinctive feature of his thinking. He reasoned that if he could lead others to embrace the idea 
that Confucianism legitimizes economic activity as a rational act. This would become a driving force for Japanese leaders and society at large to embrace the need for change. To this end, he devised a form of neo-Confucianism thought, which juxtaposed constructively notions of harmony, economy, and morality, concluding that prescribed human behavior, as defined in the Analects, did not prohibit acquisition of wealth through economic activity. These neo-Confucian perspectives uh, were a unique addition to Japanese society for two reasons. First, they broadened Confucianism's ethical scope to the level of the state, thereby superseding but not eliminating traditional behavioral norms that prescribed a set of hierarchical social relationships between children and, and parents or lords and vassals. And second, uh, his thinking proposed that based on the Confucian ethic, those engaged in commerce and industry are also obligated to render service to the public and to the state. From this perspective, national and local governments, as well as private companies and non-governmental organizations, are compelled to devise a public dimension. Explicitly, all social organizations are expected to define their relationship to the public interest and to do so hand-in-hand -hand with their profit-seeking agenda. This is a form of moral economy that he championed uh, in the late 19th century. And in this way, Eiji made clear the ethical responsibilities of those involved in the business of creating the modern nation state. The leadership he provided was rooted in a Confucian value system constructed to legitimize Japan's transformation to a modern society. Indeed, there is no irony in pointing out the remarkable similarity between the national challenges tackled by Eiji throughout his life, values, citizenship, world affairs, and those facing Japan today. Were he alive, Shibasawa, of course, would not be alone in arguing for a national and global debate, as we are currently engaged in, on democracy or economic morality, uh, or the values governing the private sector's contribution to the public good. But his voice is noteworthy because of the unique value system that shaped his thought and the moral and historical legitimacy his thinking brings to such discussion. Uh, no less than Peter Drucker has observed uh, that in Japan, uh, Shibasawa Eiji, the Meiji statesman turned business leader in the 70s and 80s, first raised fundamental questions regarding the relationship between business enterprise and national purpose, and between business needs and individual ethics. He tackled management education systematically. He envisioned the professional manager first. The rise of Japan in this century, Drucker was writing in the 20th century, to economic leadership is largely founded on Shibasawa's thought and work. So I want to move uh, now into some uh, questions uh, of significance beyond uh, the Drucker quote. Uh, and uh, I, I think, David, it's fair to say that when we began working with the Foundation on this rediscovery of the HE project, no one in their wildest dreams could imagine that uh, in 2019, on April 9th, uh, the finance minister uh, also would reveal that uh, AG's visage, as I said earlier, would be on the 10,000 man note. Uh, and I want to credit Celia, who's in the second row here, for taking the picture on the right uh, when we were in Japan at that time, uh, which actually captured this, uh, or captured this image, I should say, uh, as it happened on, uh, on the television. Uh, uh, and I, I do think that this underscores the, this historical legacy and, and the significance that uh, Japanese society and leadership attribute to uh, this captain of industry uh, who was not only an entrepreneur and a, a philanthropist. So as we move into significance, uh, clearly this was a, a person who was a major force behind Japan's early modernization. Clearly, he was a person who emphasized the importance of ethical conduct in business and civil society's place in good governance. Uh, 
The significant impact, the significance, impact, and implications of studying its legacy are of value to developing an understanding of Japan's modernization process, as well as the challenges facing economies and societies worldwide in the 21st century. And uh, I'd like to, to think that the Foundation's wide-ranging efforts these past 20 years have been both to elucidate uh, his importance as a Japanese leader, but also to shed light on his contribution to Japan's modernization through comparative study of his legacy's impact. Of equal importance to better public understanding of the role of history and the accomplishment of historical figures like Eiji, the intellectual significance of such historical insights and their bearing on the problems of, of the day uh, is that in the past 25 years, the Foundation finds itself at the forefront of a burgeoning trend in the international scholarly agenda, which I describe as the significance of public scholarship from a global perspective. Uh, this has been uh, identified uh, by Stephen Grobard as follows, by asking, is it possible that the most imperative need today is to acknowledge that the world is not becoming uniform, that national, religious, social, political, cultural, and intellectual identities call for a kind of scholarship more respectful of difference, prepared to acknowledge complexity. If this is indeed the most urgent requirement, does it not compel a reconsideration of what any individual society can by itself do to encourage such scholarship? And does it not call for the kinds of international exchange so beneficial, for example, in the natural sciences? Has the social scientific scholarship of recent years, so linked to the specific needs of American society, our society, created a parochialism that needs to be addressed and criticized? Is a new kind of international scholarship not called for in which Americans, of course still principal investigators, work more closely with those prepared to entertain different views and priorities, and those views and priorities are not typically published in English. While the term public scholarship does not in, in and of itself express the total ambition of a venture that goes beyond the practices of the 20th century, it implies that there's a public more extensive than the ones that exist in the United States that needs to be served by scholarship less wedded to the needs of a single society. And I think the foundation is an exemplary proponent of putting together interdisciplinary as well as cross-cultural teams and researchers to explore those questions. That is, to look at the legacy of this individual in comparative perspective. Now, now I want to turn to uh, uh, the significance of uh, my remarks to, to this point and uh, Japan. And I'll be spending a little bit more time in, in this part of my discussion. Uh, and this, this is where we come to the question of the, the new Meiji era of Japan. So let, let's, let's just review a couple of things as I move into this part of the presentation. In the late 19th century, Japan faced an uncertain future. No one was more aware of this than Shigusawa. Engagement with the West, rapid economic transition, the introduction of new technologies, widespread social evolution, all presented Japan with both wide open opportunities for global engagement and the prospect of political crisis and societal dislocation at home. Led by a remarkable group of commercial, political, and social leaders embodied in the careers of entrepreneurs like Shibusawa, Japan capitalized on the possibilities, avoided most of the problems, and emerged within two generations from global obscurity to the front ranks of the world community. The second decade of the 21st century presents Japan, now uniformly accepted as one of the world's great nations, with comparable problems. Years of deflation and stagnant economic growth have combined with the rise of China's economic power, the rapid aging of Japanese population, remarkable technological change, worrisome environmental challenges, uh, all of which pose serious questions for government, business, and citizens alike. Naysayers could argue that Japan's sun has set and that the country's golden age is over. Others, fewer in number, I can count myself one, uh, have confidence in Japan's ability to rebound, demonstrating the resilience and collective effort 
that has characterized the country over the past 150 years. But regardless of one's perspective, I'll agree that Japan faces major choices in the coming years and will have to make critical policy decisions and national commitments if the country wishes to continue to succeed. The Meiji Restoration transformed Japan in ways that shocked the international community and built enormous confidence across Japan. The country managed by focusing its remarkable collective energy and determination on the prospects of modernization. It managed to capitalize on real opportunities. It overcame formidable barriers, and it adjusted to emerging global realities. It did so in part through a willingness to learn from other countries, through embracing or adapting policies as necessary to fit the Japanese context. There's a sense that Japan requires a comparable transformation today to better align its administration, economy, and society with 21st century circumstances. And that's the basis of this new Meiji argument, that developing such a strategy, one that respects Japanese culture, history, and values, and that capitalizes on national strengths and global opportunities, may hold great importance for a country that realizes it must, again, adjust to changing circumstances. In national as well as comparative global context, then, Aichi's impact on Japan's early modernization does indeed remain relevant for the insight it provides regarding interconnections between past and present trends of capitalism, particularly entrepreneurship, philanthropy, civil society, and international relations. Central to Aichi's thinking was the notion of moral economy, as I've referred to earlier. Uh, and based on this perspective, and it's worth mentioning again, as noted in my remarks at the beginning of the presentation, he articulated the principle that all organizations, public, private, and non-governmental, are expected to define their relationship with the public interest, and in particular, the private sector was to do so hand-in-hand -hand with its profit-seeking agenda, thus clarifying the ethical responsibilities of those involved in the business of creating a modern state. So, as Japan enters the second decade of the 21st century, and based upon the foregoing review of the leadership vision and values of Shibasawa Eiji, what possible lessons might be explored for a new Meiji era? And I think there are two avenues that can be pursued simultaneously to confront the challenges and opportunities associated with the new Meiji. The role of individual empowerment and better governance is one, Avenue, and the links between entrepreneurship and philanthropy is is the is the end of the second. So, in terms of individual empowerment, and better governance in the new millennium, um, my thoughts are these: uh, the discussion and research initiated by the foundation since 1999 reinforce, for example, the recommendations of the 2000 publication, The Frontier Within. In Individual empowerment and better governance in the new millennium. Uh, this was commissioned by Prime Minister Obuchi, uh, uh, named uh, or titled uh, Prime Minister's Commission on Japan's Goals for the 21st Century. And the Re Obuchi Report, as it's called, in short, is an extraordinary, although underappreciated, exploration of the challenges Japan faces in the 21st century. It identifies a need for new forms of leadership and individual initiative that are comparable to the ideas that Aichi offered as Japan confronted the 20th century. Like Aichi, the Obuchi Report focuses on engaging the public in discussions of national aspirations, of empowering people in such a way that they become the chief agents leading the government to pursue national goals. And as such, it's a thoughtful discourse on the concept of civil society and the role of civ civilians must play in the face of pervasive forces of economic, cultural, and political globalization, domestic and international issues of human security, and national self-determination in an increasingly interconnected and interdependent world. So that, I think, is one avenue, the question of individuals uh, who see government uh, and their as their agent, uh, and who uh, are, are increasingly aware of their responsibilities to better uh, 
address the challenges facing Japan in the 21st century. The second example uh, that I referred to that links back to AEG is entrepreneurship and philanthropy. Many people are not aware that in 2016, Japan had the second highest concentration of high net worth individuals in the world after the United States. Exploration of the intersection between entrepreneurship and philanthropy among the newly wealthy in Japan can contribute to the creation of a strategy for a new Meiji era. Such a strategy first requires collaboration between national and local governments in the formulation of projects that encourage a role for business in global, national, and regional policy and program development. Second, engages Japan's non-governmental organization sector, which, while relatively small, has grown significantly in response to the Kobe and Tohoku natural and nuclear challenges in 1995 and 2011, respectively. And third, encourages leadership based on the principles of business management championing, championing historically by Shibasawa Ichi, as well as by contemporary entrepreneurs. Going back to Stephen Gerard and Andrew Carnegie in the United States and uh, Shibasawa Ichi in Japan, entrepreneurs have been interested in using their wealth for philanthropy. The traditional model for doing so consisted of giving financial support to organizations in areas of interest to the donors, such as universities, research institutes, or libraries. But beginning in the 1990s, a new group of entrepreneurs in the United States and other countries have sought to develop a new mode of philanthropy, generically called venture philanthropy, that would enable them to use the skills and experience they've developed in starting new businesses to address social problems. An examination of the traditional and new models of philanthropy could assist in understanding a needed dimension of Japan's new Meiji, based on some core ideas. The traditional model involves grant making from income or endowment or current income, lack of personal involvement by the donors in the work of grantees, focus on outputs, what's done rather than outcomes, what's accomplished, and limited concerns about sustainability. The new model entails a broader range of activities, including investment of assets as well as use of income, Significant participation by donors in the social change efforts, including co-production with the grantees, results performance-oriented grant making, and planning for sustainable or sustainability and exit strategies. Uh, in the United States, uh, this new model is exemplified by such organizations as Google, foundations such as the Roberts Enterprise Development Fund, corporations such as Nestle, and intermediate intermediate organizations such as the Venture Philanthropy Partners and New Profit Incorporated. In Japan, uh, there's growing interest in venture philanthropy, something I'd like to explore further. Uh, one example is, is a new social investment model uh, that is uh, analyzed by the Japan Center for International Exchange uh, and its ongoing interaction with the European Venture Philanthropy Association which studies venture philanthropy techniques. Uh, another example uh, is one uh, referred to in Japan as the Japan Venture Philanthropy Fund and the Social Venture Partners in Tokyo. So it's particularly important to address the characteristics of entrepreneurship and philanthropy in Japan from the perspective of the major challenges facing the country today. First of all, to what extent can venture philanthropists contribute to addressing the needs of rural Japan including demographic change, economic hollowing out? And is there a constructive role that such efforts might play in the hard-hit Tohoku region in the aftermath of the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear catastrophe of 2011? Second, can entrepreneurial philanthropic thinking create more opportunities for youth to understand and lead non-governmental organizations, particularly in partnership with academic organizations, thereby nurturing a new generation of philanthropists capable of shaping the emerging 21st century contours of civil society in Japan. And third, at the international level, can more non-governmental organization programs be underwritten and sustained over time that seek to address negative stereotypes that exist in and between Japan and other East and Southeast Asian countries? 
So I, uh, I want to end my, my remarks by reminding you where I started. Uh, and then I'll turn the podium back over to Professor Miyazaki to introduce David Welch. Uh, I'm hoping that in the discussion uh, that we can talk a little bit more about uh, the expectations that, that employers have for graduates to acquire expanded knowledge and skills to succeed in a global economy. Uh, I'd like to have some thoughts uh, in dialogue with you about what those essential knowledge and skill sets are. Uh, and then, of course, uh, last but certainly not least, what are the implications for the university? Uh, there's the International Strategic Plan, which I uh, referred to earlier, uh, and which uh, Professor Miyazaki referred to as one of the responsibilities that I have in the Office of International Affairs on behalf of the university. Uh, there's a particular role for the State of Study Center and the Institute of Capital Studies with regard to strategic planning. Uh, there's the question of historical study of entrepreneurship and philanthropy and the contemporary implications, whether they're in the United States, in Japan, or between our two countries. And then, uh, finally, uh, I'm going to call your attention to the handout uh, of the chronology of Shigesawa Ichi's life from 1840 to 1931, which I'll typo there, uh, which captures in the underlying portions of the the incredible array of contributions he made to Japan's modernization uh, as uh, a government leader, as a, as a captain of industry, and as a statesman for Japan through particularly difficult moments in the 19th and early 20th century. And I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions that you might have about the array of activities noted there as well. Thank you. David Welch is Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo and uh, Bowsell School, is that pronounced right? Bowsell School of International Affairs in, in Canada. He is widely known for his uh, pathbreaking discourse on theory of foreign policy, foreign policy changes, and also for his expertise on international security issues, not just of Japan, East Asia, but globally. Uh, his contributions are numerous in academic journals, monographs, and other public opinion uh, contributions. Uh, I should like to mention that he has several uh, uh, international and national book awards, one of which I'd like to mention because it's given by OSU Martian Center. It's the finest uh, book award uh, for important, most important contributions uh, uh, of the year. For his book on the Genesis and the Justice of War, something that I very much like to read. I haven't read it, but I very much intend to. Uh, so the, uh, uh, he has also worked, as uh, Professor Hirak said, with the Sigsawa uh, uh, Foundation. So uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce Professor David Watt, uh, uh, this guy. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, he oversold me, so I'm not quite that distinguished, but it's a great pleasure to be here and back at Ohio State. It's been a, a long time. Uh, a great pleasure also to share the stage with two of my favorite people, Gil Latz and uh, Shiko Sawaiichi. And I'd like to thank, of course, all the sponsors for uh, today's lecture. And, um, it's really an honor to be here. So I'm, I'm a discussant, but uh, I would like to uh, I'm not the usual discussant, because I didn't disagree with anything that Professor Latz has said. So I'm not going to challenge him on any point whatsoever, but I would like to make four points that I hope are, um, are complementary to what he said. The first point I can make very simply, which is that the image of the good society that Shibusawa Eiji had for Japan uh, more than 150 years ago, is an image of a good society that 
I think not only Japan would benefit from embracing today, but that any country would benefit from embracing today. So a lot of the social and economic pathologies that we see in Japan, we also see elsewhere. We see them here, we see them in my country, Canada, we see them in Europe. Uh, there are somewhat different challenges in each different place, but there is an underlying common thread, I would like to suggest, uh, which I'll come back to in a minute. So uh, that's point number one, quite simply, that I don't think the lessons that Shibasawa Aichi's life and teachings have to offer Japan are really only for Japan, they're for all of us. The second point I'd like to make is that Shibasawa Aichi was not just an entrepreneur, and not just a public-spirited uh, contributor to the modernization of Japan. He was extraordinarily progressive for a man of his time. So among his uh, major causes that he championed were, for example, women's education, almost unheard of as a public cause in late 19th century Japan or, or anywhere else for that matter. Um, accommodations for the disabled, again, simply wasn't a conversation at that time. Workers' rights, there was a man who founded 500 corporations or something like that, championing workers' rights. How, how many entrepreneurs today can you imagine being, being legitimate champions of workers' rights? And uh, women's education is one that particularly interests me. That, that jumped out at me when I started learning about his, his life. And he was one of the foundational figures in the creation of Japan's first women's university and consistent through his career, he, he championed women's education. Uh, there's a very interesting study that just came out, published in the Harvard Business Review, which uh, addressed the question of why is it that we see such a large gender gap in the modern economy? Why is it that boardrooms are staffed overwhelmingly with men? Why is it that men progress through the ranks more quickly than women? Why is it that men are paid so much more than women at the higher management levels of American firms? And the answer, it turns out, is not the predictable one. It's not the one that everybody thinks. If you, if you just ask even workers in these positions, managers in these positions, why is it that there's a significant gender gap between men and women, they almost always will say, well, it's because women uh, value the family side of their lives more than the men do, and they devote more of their time and energy to work-life balance. And it turns out that that's actually wrong. They don't. The main problem this study found is overwork culture. So the high-powered people in the high-powered positions in the high-powered industries are working far too hard and far too long. Not making far too much money, but that's a separate consideration. And uh, the problem is that women tend more often than men to try to take advantage of available accommodations to adjust for overwork conditions. And that has the effect of slowing them down. And they're penalized for it by their male colleagues who think less of them for taking advantage of available accommodations. So if overwork is in fact the single most important driver of gender inequality in the workplace, imagine how much worse it is in Japan. That the overwork culture in Japan is significantly uh, more serious than it is in the United States or Canada or Europe. I have a lot of Japanese friends. I try to stay in touch with them. I can almost never contact them until 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m. Japan time because they're working. They work that late. And they're back in the office at 7.30 or 8 in the morning. So small wonder that Japan fares worst of all OECD countries on gender equality measures of any kind. And it's well behind the next worst country in the OECD. Um, so Chief Sawaichi really had his finger on something when he was trying to promote women's equality by promoting women's education back in the day. So there was much more to him just then, the entrepreneurship and the philanthropy and the, and the public spiritedness. Third point I'd like to make is that uh, Shiba Saoichi did have a very detailed vision of the good society, as Gil has mentioned. 
And uh, as his life progressed, he became more and more disenchanted with the direction that Japan was taking. And when he finally died in 1931, uh, it was, I think, with something of a broken heart, because he didn't see Japan developing in the direction that he had hoped and envisioned. Japan did, of course, embrace modernization uh, remarkably, uh, did astonishingly well in catching up with the Europe and the United States in technology and in modern organization and in the capacity of a modern bureaucratic state to um, provide goods and services for the people, but also to extract rents and redirect their energies in directions that Shibasa Aichi would not have approved of. He was not a fan of the uh, imperial policy Japan followed in the 1920s and 1930s most enthusiastically. And uh, I think he probably would have said that what Japan got right was the need to modernize, but what Japan did not get right was to put a check on the collectiv collectivism, right? The, the nationalism that was really fueling a lot of the modernization drive. It wasn't strictly necessary that it had to happen that way. And I think he lamented the, the error in the direction of too much collectivism. And for those of you who are, who are historians interested, for example, in the Second World War, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, mind-boggling tales of Japanese commanders and soldiers and sailors and the degree to which they were willing to sacrifice themselves uh, on behalf of the country, on behalf of the emperor. Uh, it was so bad that in the, in the famously grisly Battle of Guadalcanal, uh, U.S. Marines took to not even bothering trying to capture Japanese prisoners when they beat them in, in skirmishes and battles. Because the Japanese prisoners, a significant proportion of the time, would pretend to be dead. And then when the American soldiers came to take them away, cart them off to a prison facility, they would blow themselves up. So it was much safer just to shoot Japanese uh, wounded than to try to take them under captivity in accordance with the requirements of the Geneva Conventions, for example. So this is a hyper-nationalism, hyper-collectivization that was uh, leading Japan in the wrong direction from, from his perspective. Now, the post-war period is Japan's second great modernization. And uh, it's remarkable in its ability to transcend and reject the first one. So Japan very successfully eliminated militarism as a, as a doctrine, successfully eliminated the role of the military in policy and policy making, successfully democratized, and over time recovered remarkably quickly and remarkably effectively from utter devastation in World War II. I think Shibasa Aichi, had he lived, to look at what happened, would have been pleased with Japan's recovery, but would have been depressed at how Japan erred so dramatically in the other direction, away from public spiritedness, away from a sense of concern for fellow Japanese, and how, how much Japan has become an atomized, anomic society. It's a society in which people can spend their whole lives virtually not interacting with anyone other than immediate family members and, and people uh, in, the, in the workplace. It's a country which has plagued by the problem of the hikikomori, high suicide rates, the high levels of depression, disaffection. So it's gone too far in the other direction, away from the collective spirit. He would have lamented that as well. Just to illustrate that point, I, I frequently teach at the National Defense Academy in Yokosuka which is Japan's version of the West Point. If you've been to West Point, you'll, you'll know that the cadets there are there because they want to be there, and they're there because they want to defend the country. So at the beginning of one class that I taught at uh, Bodai, I went around the room and I asked all the Japanese cadets why they had decided to come to the National Defense Academy. And the answers I got were fascinating. The first student said, well, my girlfriend lives nearby. 
second student said it was cheap third student said i wanted to learn a skill the fourth student said i couldn't get into all the other universities that i wanted to get into and so it went one by one by one and finally i got to one student who said i want to serve my country and research done by professor takako ikotani at columbia university shows somewhat shockingly that when asked the question are you willing to risk your life in defense of the country japanese civilians and soldiers alike give shockingly low affirmative replies roughly in the 30 percent range for soldiers right that's a far cry from 1930s early 1940s japan so it's it's fundamentally changed as a society and i think she was our age she would also disapprove of that so the the new meiji concept is a under conversation these days that tries to look back on his teachings and his understanding of the good society of japan is i think a helpful way of trying to understand the proper correction to those two earlier deviations from his original vision and uh if we're students of hegel or polanyi we're familiar with the concept of thesis antithesis synthesis or or the double movement very often through history we have important changes that arise as reactions to one trend or development results in some kind of over correction and then at the end of the day you have a new reaction to the reaction that is net positive and that's the way in which societies often progress will japan get there um we don't know it's early to tell but there are signs that there is a growing consciousness in japan that this is necessary and that this should happen so that was my third point the relevance of hegel to shibisawa eiji my last point is that japan is a country that has a long history of overcoming really significant challenges and overcoming them successfully in at least an important sense and it's it's never smart to count japan out i'm i'm totally with gil on that i'm optimistic long term on japan but japan i think is especially important to pay attention to today precisely because it's a country that has so many challenges but they're challenges that are not unique to japan they're challenges that much of the rest of the world will also be facing and these include demographic transition and ultimately demographic decline aging society energy transition difficulties natural resource limitations it's a this is the right time to be looking at japan for insight as to how to solve these kinds of challenges and that also was a sentiment shared by shibisawa masahide and the people at the shibisawa foundation who have been working with gil with me and others so very long precisely to try to see what we can learn from the legacy of shibisawa eiji for solving japan's future oriented problems and i i'd like to end just by mentioning i'm involved in two other things that share this particular concern and mandate one is the japan futures initiative which is a network of scholars and practitioners and policy makers who are interested in the social scientific study of japan with an eye toward understanding how to solve the challenges japan is facing that the rest of us will be facing down the line so if you're interested in the japan futures initiative you'd like to get on the mailing list send me a an email note and i'll make sure i get you on the other initiative is a project funded by the santori foundation called re-examining japan in global context again it's exactly the same mandate i co-direct this project with my colleague tanobro masayuki from keio university and we hold three or four symposia every year devoted to looking at a particular issue of concern to japan and how to address it we make our reports of our symposia online available online in both english and japanese again if you just google re-examining japan in global context you'll find all the material there all of this is the 
the result of inspiration from she was our age and so i actually don't have a great deck in my own professional development and it's been a treat and an inspiration to work with the people at the foundation and with gail and like i said i've got nothing to criticize in bill's presentation i hope some of that added a little bit of additional meat on the bones and with that we'd both be happy to take any questions you might have thank you very much
much about good japanese behavior in korea because that's politically incorrect in korea but there was undoubtedly some of it and i think he was a little bit involved in some of the better japanese behavior in korea
think that if japan makes the kinds of adjustments that bill is talking about it will be in a in better shape to deal with its own future challenges i wouldn't want to be the one who tries to solve china's future challenges i think they're just overwhelming and it's a very very long list so i'm bullish on japan in the future i am not bullish on china unless there's some dramatic and interesting political change in china that actually results in genuine participatory democracy of some kind stable rule of law independent judiciary all of the kinds of things you need if you want to become a high income country no country's ever become a high income country without those things unless they are either oil exporters china is not or singapore and china's not singapore i don't have anything further to add i think that's an excellent answer uh there there is uh i would i would just post and perhaps david wants to comment on it that uh china's demographic trajectory is very similar in terms of the problems it's going to encounter as what we see happening in japan the reasons for it are somewhat different but the trend is similar and so the labor shortage will affect china in the future and japan has been amazingly successful in creating what i would call a distributed economic production system outside the country that has its own its own problems but uh china would have to follow in japan's footsteps in that regard might learn something from japan about the trials and challenges associated with it but but even with the encouragement of having more than one child for a family i don't see a dramatic change in the long-term demographic prospects and the social scientists have been predicting for a long time that this would be a challenge facing japan but it didn't register on the general public consciousness until very recently when the evidence was impossible to ignore the population is actually contracting in japan but i don't know if you want to add any further to what your observations yesterday about the demographic trends yeah i'm always a little bit amused when my japanese friends and colleagues wring their hands about japan's demographic crisis about a declining population their population is about 126 million now the reason they conquered east asia back in the 1920s was they were panicked about their rapid population explosion and they only had 50 million people then so japan can do very well with 50 million people it's just a question of adjusting how things work china's demographic problem is worse than japan's they're going to experience aging faster than japan is they're experiencing it later than japan but it will be worse and they also have that twist thrown in which is a a gender imbalance right so there's more men than women in the younger cohorts because of the one child policy and the cultural preference for sons over daughters and this is especially challenging because unless china modernizes culturally dramatically the expectation that it's the daughters who care for the elderly parents is going to be very hard to operationalize and there's there's very little in the way of an effective chinese state apparatus for dealing with serious elder care challenges japan is way ahead of china on that as well so that's among the many many difficult problems facing the chinese it's somewhat macabre to say but the one thing that's sort of saving china's bacon in this respect now is the fact that the life expectancy is not as long as in japan so one hates to say it but one one solution is to just let people die off younger and then you don't have such a big elder care problem but again that's that's not that's not a selling point for the regime in terms of domestic legitimacy yes yeah your your earlier mention of globalization kind of inspires this question i'm curious if uh the shibasawa's legacy extended beyond japan so dr welch you mentioned that maybe there was a sense or if you were to look into the future beyond the fact that there might have been some disappointment that japan had lost its way from the teachings but is there any evidence that 
attribute his, his impact on economic systems to his thinking, but it is the case that if you look at, at uh, uh, just-in-time manufacturing and quality improvement circles, those ideas started in the United States. They were adopted by the Japanese after World War II, and then they migrated back to the United States. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't take an example like that. That's a very powerful one. Where I do see his, his uh, fingerprints, though, is in terms of non-governmental organizations. He helped establish the, uh, the Japan America Society in New York City. Uh, he was instrumental in the League of Nations and Japan's involvement in the League. Uh, not successful involvement, but nonetheless he represented uh, those interests. Uh, a whole series of things in the handout that show uh, not only his domestic interest in establishing uh, avenues outside of government for uh, pursuing ways that, that would uh, lead to deeper understanding between peoples across the Pacific uh, that uh, really have, have had a lasting impact to this day. Uh, and uh, his, his great grandson, by the way, whose picture I showed you, in, the in 1970 wrote a book called Bridge Across the Pacific, uh, which was his effort to understand his great grandfather. Uh, and he's recently uh, just published it again, this time in English. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it really, the, the last third of Eiji's life was devoted to statesmanship and how he could uh, create better understanding outside of Japan about the characteristics of Japan, too. Uh, and in some ways, as David mentioned in his four points, Shinsao Eiji anticipated that Japan's uh, a rapid ascent would create resentment around the world and that it, it was a country that needed to work harder at telling its story to other people. Uh, and he was a champion of that, including establishing the national broadcasting system as an, a, an avenue of communication. But his, uh, his innovative thinking in, in that regard was not taken up by his peers or by those who followed him. But he, was, he had a long-lasting impact, I think, on, on interaction uh, at the non-governmental level. Uh, there's, there's even an argument by a colleague of ours in Japan, which is well received, that, that business diplomacy was championed, championed by uh, AG in, in, a, in a unique way during his lifetime and since. I think that's, that's all right. But one thing I would add is that I think he's got no name recognition value outside Japan. I mean, very, very little. He's not well known. And he's not even particularly well known in Japan. I, I ask my Japanese friends, what do you know about him? And they say, oh, I think we went to visit the museum once when I was in school. But that's about all they can really tell you about it. Um, so he, he, he did not go down in history as a particularly famous individual. I think in part because the nationalists and militarists were not interested in promoting his legacy at the time. And then I saw another thing. Well, thank you very much to you both for very interesting presentations. I'm, I'm curious, and I wonder if I might ask uh, whether Shibusawa's uh, ideas that he propounded have influenced your work as educators and um, in, in academia. Are there ideas that you are conscious of perhaps um, applying in some way? The question is whether uh, Shibasawa's our exposure to his thinking has influenced our work as academics. Would you like to take that one first? So not directly to my own research, which is mostly in the areas of international security and foreign policy and, and international theory. But uh, his mission was inspirational in, and, and um, encouraging really learned the importance of what he was trying to do in building the bridges, in reaching out, in internationalizing, in uh, exposing people to other cultures, trying to build empathy between, between cultures, and his very energetic efforts to get Confucianism <coughs> to speak to Japan in a new and meaningful way. It's the kind of uh, synthetic bridge 
building that we could, we could use a lot more of that today. We're at a time in our history where it's pull off the drawbridges, and uh, that scares him. So I think we need people like him uh, to have an effect on others and try to keep those drawbridges down. Okay, we're going to answer that when we have time. Um, I, uh, the way he's inspired me too has been indirect, uh, but in this last period, this one, uh, last one third of his life, uh, he was very concerned about the uh, anti-Japanese sentiment in the United States in the, in the first couple of uh, decades of the, of the 20th century, and he led uh, delegations to our country to uh, try and build bridges, as David just mentioned. Uh, and, and so that had already made a big impression on me before the current moment where uh, we seem to be withdrawing from the role that we've played over the last 70 years in the world. Uh, and now it's even more poignant to imagine uh, the risks uh, that he took uh, and, and the going against the grain attitudes and even having the confidence to go to another country, which he admired tremendously. Started out admiring Europe, but uh, soon after his first trip to the United States, he became fascinated with the American notion of democracy and, and the ways in which America uh, grew into a powerful nation over such a short period of time. And he realized that Japan's destiny, in, in some way, was going to be tied to uh, Japan's, uh, to, to America's, to the American relationship. So, so I found that uh, his, his example uh, has encouraged me to bring the story into the classroom. Uh, so that would be my, my most general. And then the more specific example is what I tried to illustrate in my opening remarks, that if, if we're even as public institutions being held more accountable today by the business community to graduate students with intercultural competency, not, not skills with a small s, but intercultural competencies and understandings and critical thinking capacities, then are there lessons from this story that can help inform our students uh, about different ways of approaching uh, problems? And it seems to me that is a question we need to ask ourselves, other universities need to ask themselves about how to bring global themes into the curriculum and that, that bringing those things in, such as this story, enlarges one's thinking. Uh, and uh, then finally, I would, I would just go back to what, what David said, that this notion of good society, the idea of moral economy, uh, the, the idea of creating uh, a profit, but also being mindful of, of the good, um, early notions uh, in uh, his thinking about civil society, that this is a reminder that there are innovative ways to approach those very difficult questions, even outside of the Western uh, historical framework, and that we, uh, if not adopting those ideas exactly, can be stimulated by those stories to think anew about some of our social contracts and commitments uh, to our own history as we look backwards and forwards at the same time. I have one economic question that you allow me. Please. Uh, so the, I believe that uh, from your presentation, as well as what little I know Chikawa's uh, philosophy, I think he was for real market economy. Right. And there is a big theorem in economics that many American specialists of business people believe in that the individual hand works best, let the free competition come in, without always socially optimal. That the other machines can be for hundreds around. But what happens in the process of industrialization, globalization, whatever have you, is the market failure somehow doesn't work for everybody. They are losers, and they are the gainers. And there are even worse environmental and social problems that come from individual maximization of whatever they are seeking. And we call that market failure in my profession, and that justifies government intervention with everyone the government to correct it. But it, it increasingly became clear, both in the episodes in Europe, Japan, and the world in the US, there was no call for this market 
to this, this event when he 